Hi everyone, welcome to the second episode of the uh, online uh, WOMF tutorial. Uh, this tutorial is uh, presented by Dr. Mike Donahue and moderated by uh, Dr. Don Porter. Uh, both of them are the creators of uh, WOMF and uh, um, also moderated by uh, uh, me and uh, Professor Kirill Balashenko. So, um, before we start a tutorial, let me uh, reiterate the, uh, the the rules, in particular on how to ask questions. If you're watching this uh, live on Twitch, you can ask questions at any time on the chat box in the uh, in Twitch. Um, please type your questions uh, clearly, and uh, uh, we'll compile those questions and uh, fit it to Dr. Mike Donahue, and uh, he will decide whether he wants to answer those questions. Uh, during a lecture or whether uh, at the end of the, uh, the lecture or maybe answer it later on the uh, NanoHub forum. And if you're watching this on Zoom, please ask questions to one of the moderators through private chat. So if you click the participants uh, uh, button, in the participants uh, list, you can see that the three of us has a uh, thumbs up. We have a, a moderators before our names. So those three are the, the, the moderators. Just uh, um, click on them right uh, uh, and uh, start a chat and uh, type your questions to us. And again, we'll compile those questions and uh, feed it to uh, Dr. Mike Donahue. So uh, I think that will be all. Please, everyone in Zoom, stay muted and also uh, turn off your uh, webcam to save the bandwidth. So we'll begin the second episode of this uh, class. Dr. Donahue, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jin. Um, well, I do want to mention, I think it's the case, you maybe confirm, if you're on Twitch and you want to ask a question, I think you need to have a Twitch account. Yes, you will have to register on Twitch in order okay. to type your question, yeah. Just thank so you. people know that. Okay, uh, a little bit of unfinished business from last time. I was, at the end of the last session, I was doing installs, uh, demo installs on, on Windows and the Mac, and I got a question about doing a demo on, uh, on Linux. And I explained at the time that all my Linux boxes were on the NIST network and Zoom is currently prohibited on the NIST network so I couldn't do an install a demo. However, I had forgotten about um, the Windows uh, subsystem for Linux, the WSL, which, window, which Microsoft has been shipping with Windows for several years now. And it allows you to download and install a Linux distribution on top of your uh, Windows kernel. So I did this over the weekend it literally takes five minutes to get a basic um, Linux install. You just go into the PowerShell, you issue a command to enable the WSL, and then you go to the Microsoft App Store. You download, they have a list of like a dozen different Linux distributions you can download and install. And you do that, and it's a minimal, it starts out being a minimal Linux install, so it only takes a couple minutes, and then you can install more stuff as you need. So right here, for example, I, I did an Ubuntu install, Okay, so this is my window. Let me look at OS release here. Okay, and you can see it's Ubuntu 20.04. Okay, and so this, I've got all the command line tools that you would normally have on, on Linux. Um, however, if you do look at the kernel, you will see that you've got Microsoft's name here embedded in the kernel. So it's really running on Windows, but it's really slick. I'm really impressed with how fast and how smooth it is. So let's go through, step through quickly, how you do an oomph install on an Ubuntu, okay? So there's my home directory. Um, just to show you, there's nothing up my sleeves here. There's nothing in here right now. Um, forget about this oomph baked for a moment. We'll get to that in a minute. But the first step is to download the tarball for, for oomph. Now, normally I'd go to a web browser, go to the oomph page, uh, go to the software distribution page and click on the link. I haven't installed a web browser on, on this Ubuntu here. But curl comes installed already. So, uh, okay. So there is the command. I know the URL. I hooked it up. There's the URL for the 2.0 A2 tarball uh, dash O to install it to a file. I actually could probably just pipe this straight into tar, though I didn't try that. So let's go ahead and grab it. And this takes about 10 seconds. Normally, let's see. It's a little bit slower today. The uh, network is maybe a little. A little bit busier. <clears throat> okay, but now I have it. All right, so there is a tarball I just installed. And then the next step is you unpack the tarball. There we go. 
Okay, that's done. Now, if I look here, I have a new directory called oomph, right there, oomph. So we go into oomph, okay, and that's the standard stuff. Now, the first thing you should always do when you're installing Linux, I'm oh, sorry, when you're installing oomph uh, from source is you should always run um, oomph.tickle plus platform to do a sanity check on what you got. Oh, and look, it tells me, it says command, tickle sh not found, okay, because this is a bare install. I haven't installed tickle yet. But it gives me the command that I can use to install it. So let's do that. And continue, yes. And we just go through that install and okay, tickles installed. Let's try that uh, platform command again. Okay. And let's see, if we look up here in the output, you'll see uh, wish, can't find a wish shell program. Hmm, so if you run wish, again, it tells you that you need to install TK, right? There's a command right there that you need to install. So there it is, run that. And yes, I'm gonna install it. Okay, now you may already have, if you have a working system, you may already have some of these things already installed, in which case they will just work before that. Now I do the platform again. Now you see I get some warnings down here. It says your tickle appears to be missing the header file. Okay, you may need to reinstall tickle or install the developer's package. This is the, this is the thing here. You need to have the developer's package installed in order to build things like oomph against tickle. And it's the same thing with TK. If I do, uh, let's see, what's the command? So if I do an apt list tickle grep dev, is that it? You see here, here's all the things which are available for tickle dev. And there's the first one I want is tick dev. So we just have to do uh, install tick dev. And there's the same thing for TK. There's also TK dev. You need to install them both, two separate packages. We're done. Okay, so now when I do my plus platform, I get beautiful output. I get no warnings down here. One thing I did a small cheat on is you notice the compiler. Um, when I did the base install, the compiler was not installed. I had to, it's the same thing. If you type G++, I'll tell you what you need to do, which is apt install G++. That takes several minutes. Uh, the new compiler tools are pretty big package, so I did that one ahead of time. But otherwise, we're good to go, All right? And so now we just do pi make. Okay, and we're off, okay? And so this compiles and it go, it'll go straight through. At least it should. If it doesn't, uh, uh, track the error messages and send them to me and we'll see what we can do. But I'm going to go ahead and stop this now because it takes several minutes to build, at least on this box. And I'm going to go over into the oomph baked. So this is like the, the cooking shows where they start the recipe and then they put the unfinished one under the counter and they pull out the cooked one. So that's what this is. This is the one that I built over the weekend. Uh, so I have um, uh, the compiled has gone through completion, and now I can just run oomph.tickle and let's see if I have my screen tip. There it is. Okay. See the little X there? This is running on Ubuntu, and it's the whole thing just like you normally have. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and exit this. Okay. It actually runs very, very fast. Uh, if you want to, anytime you're doing these, um, uh, a build from source, if you want to, after you finish the build, you can try running Luxus Regression, which is our, our test suite that we use in-house. And it will start running. There's a bunch of, a bunch of test samples. There may be a few errors. They probably don't mean anything. We're still, try still developing the tests. A lot of the tests, they're um, floating point sensitive, a lot of them. So sometimes things fail. Uh, which doesn't really mean anything, but other than the test is bad. But at uh, any rate, I'll stop that there. And I'm going to get out of here. Um, I don't think we have any questions on this. Okay, this is pretty straightforward, and it'll be on the video, so you can go back and see it if you need to. Okay, let's get to the, um, not that one, this one. Okay, begin my talk proper here. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, like last week, special thanks to everyone that made this possible. Uh, the online Spintronic Seminar, uh, NanoHub, IEEE Magnetic Society. And of course, we ha I have to give you my disclaimer. Um, uh, trademarks, uh, et cetera, are for identification purposes only. They do not uh, constitute endorsement by, by NIST. Okay, so today I'm going to start off introducing Lymph. The last talk was mostly about micromagnetics in general, aside from the demos. This time I'm going to give a little bit more background information on Oomph. I'll do a widget demo. And then I think the bulk of the session actually will be on the MIF files. These are the input files. So if you want to run a simulation on Oomph, this is how you do it. It's kind of complicated, so we'll start with that. Um, and then I have a homework problem, which I will describe. And um, not quite sure. We can maybe, the way to do this is to set up a separate uh, category uh, in the NanoHub forum. Uh, for the homework problem. We can put some hints in there and you can work amongst yourselves, okay? So let's, okay. Oh, and here's the schedule for the rest of the sessions, right? So I was going to talk about some of the pitfalls in micromagnetic programming uh, simulations, um, but I decided to push that back a week so people could get started working with them, okay? And then we'll see what we end up doing the last two weeks some more advanced topics, okay? Okay, so just a little background. So originally back in, I don't know, 96, 97, something like that, uh, Bob McMichael had, and I were starting to work on micromagnetics. And at that time, it was, micromagnetics was really a bit of a cottage industry. There were no shared codes at all. There was no commercial codes for micromagnetics. Everyone who was doing micromagnetics had their own in-house code that they developed. They, they were not working on the same problems. They weren't sharing code. It was really difficult to sort of compare uh, the codes and see what was actually working, what was not working. Okay, this was in the 90s was really the first time when we had enough computational power to do something interesting with micromagnetics. Micromagnetics theory itself had gone back to like the 50s and 60s, as I mentioned last time. So, and Bob was really, Bob McMichael was really the spearhead on, on MUMAG, which was this idea to bring people together. And we had uh, sort of two legs for this. One was a standard problem suite, because people weren't working on the same problems. We said, well, let's put together a collection of problems and we'll have people with their own codes run those problems, see their answers, and send them in, and then we'll collect them when we can compare. Okay, so that's the standard problem suite. It's still going today. And then the other aspect was to build a code which everyone could use as a common, for common comparison, and even use as a base for their own development, uh, especially for grad students. You come in, you have a small problem that you want to do in micromagnetics, but to do it, if you have to write a whole micromagnetics code, that takes a long time, and it's a little bit tricky, and so you make errors, and so the idea was to have a code base that students could take and add to, and also professionals too. So we'll see some of that um, in the contributed uh, uh, extensions, okay? But still here, you can go to this and you can, there's a mailing list. If you want to get on the mailing list, it's actually run through CTCMS. And there's archives now, they're also available if you have a Google account. So here's the current standard problems. Here's the first one, which turned out to be too big for the time. It's not too big now, but it was at the time. Um, and then we did one, another, the first two problems involved hysteresis because that's what basically we could do back then. Um, the third one involved energy minimization problem where you look at, you change the size of a part and you see what different uh, uh, configurations, magnetic configurations are available depending upon the part size. The fourth one I think I've shown you already was a dynamic problem where you apply a pulse and you see what happens with the switch. And the most recent one uh, involves um, current and plane spin torque. Okay, with those sort of dimensions. We try to keep the problems small so that people can do them as, can do them easily, and maybe even include them as part of a larger paper. Now, if you go to the, the MUMAG website, these are all listed along with the solutions, so you can see those. Okay, the other leg of the two-legged stool, be careful, uh, is OMF, um, which is a finite difference code. We have a graphical user interface, which I'm going to describe today. It runs on Windows, Unix, Mac, um, actually, any Linux box, you can probably get it to run without too much effort. Um, we provide binaries for Windows currently, otherwise you have to you get the source code. The source code is included with the binary, so if you download the binary, you get the source code too. Um, it uses Tickle, TK, and C++. Okay, so the com computations are done in C++. The GUI is done in TK and Tickle. And the input files, the MIF files, are actually an extended version of Tickle. Okay? I do want to stress this a little bit, that Tickle and TK are technically two separate things, although they're often packaged together. And they depend a lot, TK depends a lot on Tickle, although not vice versa. So in order to edit and write uh, MIF files, you need to know about Tickle, but you don't need to know anything about TK to write MIF files. 
There's a user's manual, which you can find on the MFLIB page. It's also included in the distributions. It's currently about 250 pages. And OOMF is now available on NanoHub also, as we pointed out a few times. There are also third-party extensions. Most, uh, there's, a, there's I think about a dozen of them that actually, the third-party extensions that are included in the distribution are built into the binaries. If you build the source, you'll get them automatically. There are a few extensions, I think there are two extensions which are also shipped, which are not built and not included in the binary because they involve extra libraries. So for example, there's an extension which uses the CDODE library um, to do um, other types of integration. Uh, so for the LLG equation. So we've got Runga Cut, we, I've got a Runga Cut solver in the base package. But if you want to use like some um, implicit integration or you want to use um, one of the predictor corrector techniques, atoms, things like that, uh, that's available in the CDODE package. But then you, know, you need to have the CDODE library installed, which is not tough, but it's an extra hurdle uh, to get to running oomph, which I didn't want to require people, okay? Uh, oh, important message. Oomph is free software, okay? Um, and I am not independently wealthy. I depend on NIST to pay my bills. And every year I have to have a review and I have to make a case, I have to make an argument that Oomph uh, development should continue like it has been for the last 20 years or so. And the main tool I have, the main argument I have to say, yeah, this is an important thing. It's contributing to the economy, which is part of NIST's mission, is to look at the citations. So I can say, well, in the last year, um, there have been this many citations of oomph in the referee journal literature. Obviously, it's an important thing. We should continue it. And they said, yeah, okay. That will only continue as long as people continue to cite us. Okay, if you, if you don't do that, oomph is going to die. All right. And uh, if that happens, then I might have trouble paying my bills. And most importantly, this dog's going to go hungry. All right. So if you don't want to do it for oomph, do it for me, do it for the dog. Okay. And, and while I'm thinking about it, the third-party extensions, um, those people also typically, uh, in, the, in the examples they give or, in the, or somewhere on their page where you read the documentation, they'll say, you know, we wrote this uh, extension, we used it in this paper, please cite this paper if you use our extension, okay? Please do that as well because we want to encourage people to write extensions and contribute them to the ecosystem. Also, many of these people probably have dogs too, or cats if that's your thing, goldfish, dribbles, whatever it is, okay? So please remember to cite, okay? Okay, so this is the, um, the file layout for OOMF. I wanted to give you a, a little bit of background on how things are laid out because if there are any problems or even if you're looking for examples, it's good to know where to go in the OOMF file system to look for stuff, okay? So the top level directory is OOMF or depending upon if you get a snapshot or something, it may be OOMF dash some version number, okay? Underneath that, there are four directories, app, config, doc, and package. The app is where all the uh, individual applications like the solver, um, the, uh, the display widgets, and stuff like that are all under app. Um, config is where configuration files are. So if you have any trouble with the install, you're going to be going into the config directory and tweaking some files down there to get things fixed. Doc is where the documentation is. Okay, so here's the config, expand it out. Uh, under config, there's a platforms directory, which is going to have a bunch of tickle files, such as windows x86 underscore 64 tickle. This is the platform, under platforms is platform specific uh, install stuff. And so this is, this particular file here is the one if you need to edit to change things which are specific to windows, okay? If we're running on Linux, it's going to be linux x86 64. If we're running on Mac, it's going to be Darwin. Okay, darwin.tickle is a, is a platform file for, for the Mac. Um, and so if you need to have some, if there are some problems with the install or running, that's probably the file you're gonna to have to edit. If you go up a, a level to the config, there's a file called options.tickle, which has um, some various options which are not platform specific and you may wanna tweak those also. Under the doc folder, there is uh, a user guide uh, subfolder. And in there is the PDF version of the user guide. It's the same as what's on, on the website. And if you go under user guide to user guide, there is an index.html, which is the entry point into the HTML version of the user guide. So whichever is more convenient for you. Uh, packages, libraries, these are libraries that Don and I use for the rest of them. You shouldn't have any need to go into there. And then I think the next slide here shows you what's underneath app, okay? So each of the, the widgets you see, in an archive data table, which I'll display in a few minutes, uh, get graph. OXS is a solver, okay? There are two interfaces. There's OXSII, Oxy, 
which is the interactive interface to OXS. And then there's Boxy, B-O-X-S-I, which is a batch interface to Oxy. Okay, they're really nearly the same. The, the engine underneath is the same. Um, I wanted to point out here, EXT, this is the directory where we stick all the OXS EXT class ex classes that are going to be your main interaction. The main thing you're going to interact with in MIF files are EXT objects, which all the ones that I and Don write are going to be in this directory. There's a parallel directory called local, which also has EXT objects in it. These are third party contributions primarily. Okay. Uh, there's a contrib area. That's kind of like the closet where we store uh, third party extensions. There's a little tool called OXSPKG, which will move things from here to here. Um, because as I mentioned before, I don't uh, install all of the contributed, contributed software that we have because of third party uh, dependencies. Okay. All right, so let's keep going here. What's next? Okay, the widget demo. So I'm going to come out of this. I'm going to hopefully launch oomph and um, just walk you through some, some of the demos, some of the stuff here. So let me pull up. This is, a, this is a Windows box I'm running on here. And there's my oomph install from last time. So I'll double click on that. for it to come up. Okay, so this is the MM launch program. Okay, this is the first thing you bring up. Uh, there are a bunch of different applications in OOMF. They talk to each other over local sockets. And so they need a place to, to uh, talk to each other to figure out what sockets they are where, 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 each, where everybody's listening. And so this is the machine, and then, you, then this is the account name that I'm running under. And here are the list of the GUI programs. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Oxy first, which is the, the main solver. It's a 3D solver. Um, you have to bring up another checkbox here to actually bring up the interface. It's running behind the scenes, um, and it's set up to be pretty resistant to shutting down. So it ignores, if you're on Unix, it ignores uh, hang up signals. Uh, to kill it, you need to use a term or a, a, a not dash nine. So it will tend to run even if you close everything else. So I'll keep running in the background. You can come back later and reopen it. So this interface, you can bring this interface up and down if you need to do something else on your screen or whatever. I'm not sure if it stays up across logouts or not because I never log out on my account, but it might. Okay, so let's look at file. Let's open up a, a sample file here. So you go file load. Okay, and um, I should mention this on the previous slide, but the main examples for OXS, you go under app, there are examples for each of these. For most of these widgets, there's examples. If you go into their directory, there's going to be an example subdirectory. So here, for example, under mmdisp, there's an example directory there which has sample files that you can load into mmdisp. But I'm going to go into OXS down here. Well, let me explain this widget. So the, this corner right in the corner here, and there's a number of widgets like this. In OMF. These, are, these are showing your very available directories and this is the current directory, directory that you're in. These are subdirectories which are available. Over here are a list of files which meet this, these globbing patterns. So I'm looking for star.mif files right now because I'm looking to load a problem into Oxy. And so that's what it's looking for. And so I can go down, double click into examples, and then I have a list of these things. Uh, if you want to, you can change the filter is. So for example, if I want to look for a standard problems, I can do that and I'll just list the standard problems. Uh, this thing can be resized. Like so uh, if you need to make, sometimes the names get long here and this is not wide enough. You have to put the cursor sort of over here to the, to the right of that bar in order to change its size, but you can do that. Um, let's go ahead and load the third standard problem. When I click on that, this is the problem, this box here, this is the problem I'm going to load. That's the directory, the full directory. It's, sometimes you have to scroll over to see the end of it. That's the problem I'm going to load. Um, there's some things here. The number of threads that you want to run. You probably don't want to run more threads than you have cores in your machine and they just step on themselves, run slow. The parameters, these are runtime options. So when you write your MIF file, there's a parameters keyword which says, has a variable that gets some value and you can change what that value is when you go to run it. Okay, there's also a command line option for this. So this is very convenient if you want to run a parameter study where you're running lots of simulations and you want to tweak just one value. 
you don't have to modify the MIF file every time. You just put parameter in the MIF file. And then when you go to launch it, you can specify what value you want. You know, so it'd be something like, oops, you know, I gotta select the right box. You know, it'd be something like A, um, 20 E minus 12, if I wanted to change uh, the exchange coefficient. Provided that in my MIF file, I specified that A was, was a parameter, okay? So when we get to the MIF files, we'll all show that. The restart button. If you're running a simulation and it runs for some period of time, and then it crashes, oh, well, if it's been running for weeks or something, or at least days, you don't wanna to have to start from the very beginning. If you click on this restart button, then it will try to load a checkpoint and pick up where it left off, okay? So this is very useful. Um, by default, the checkpoint files are written every 15 minutes, but there are ways to turn that off or make it more frequent, and I'll get to that in a moment also. Um, the rescan button, if you change the directory, anything, if you add files to a directory or something, rescan will just rescan the directory. Um, if I type close, then this widget goes away and nothing happens, okay? If I type okay, it will load this file and then close the dialog. A lot of these dialogues in, in them have a button up here called browse. If you click on that, then the okay turns to apply. And what that does is it applies, it loads the file, but then it keeps this uh, file load widget open, which is kind of convenient if you're looking through a bunch of files to load them one by one and take a look at it. Um, also, if you go back into Oxy, if you look under the file again, you see this load dialog, it's now in red, right? Um, that tells you that that dialog is already open. And if you click on it, it will bring it to the top of the stack if it's hidden underneath, if you have a lot of windows open like I often do. Okay, so now I have a problem loaded. Let's go and look at the MM disk. I did this last time, but just to refresh and show you some more details. This is the widget for displaying. Well, I should maybe mention that Oxy on its own, it runs, but it doesn't do any output directly, okay? So you have to tell it that when you want output. But you can either do that interactively as I'm doing here. There are also options inside the MIF file to say, oh, I want to send this out, I want to send that out. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But if you just load Oxy and run it, it'll run happily, but it won't produce any output for you to see. So keep that in mind. There are different outputs in Oxy. Um, so the first one on here is data table. I'll get to that in a moment. That's just uh, scalar data. The rest of these are what we call fields. Uh, where a field just means that uh, you cross the simulation, every point in the simulation has got uh, a value associated with it. It can be either a scalar value or a three vector value. These are all, well, most of these are three vector values. And uh, you, there are certain widgets which know how to display that sort of information. So for example, MMDesk. And then if you hit the send button, it will send it out, okay? And so here's that, what, here's the initial configuration for standard problem number three. It's a random configuration. This is MMDisp. Um, it also has an open. You can load files from disk if you want. You can also save. If I wanted to, I could save this, this file. I could save it. Uh, let's pull up that save dialog. Okay, again, just like the other one, as long as it's up, it's red, so you can click to it easily. You can, here's ones which are already in this directory. The default directory here is going to be the one, same directory as the MIF file is in. Uh, unless you're on NanoHub, in which case they do things a little bit differently because it's a shared file system. You specify whether you want text output, which is easy for bringing into other programs, uh, four byte binary, which is smaller, or eight byte binary, which is um, a real eight. That's the full precision that we work at. Rectangular grid uh, is what OOMF works in. You can also store it though as a regular grid where instead of writing out um, just the components of the vectors and a header that tells you where every point is, it gives you six values for each point, which are the position and the value. We're still on a regular grid, um, but depending upon what you're importing into, that may be a little easier to work with. There are also command line tools which will convert from here to here, but not the other way. Again, there's a browse button if I want to save, if I want to keep this dialog open. And I think that's, okay, and again, it's the same layout as the last one. There's, this is the current directory that you're working in. Here's a filter. Here are the defaults are a little bit different because these are vector field files, which are OMF, OVF, and so on primarily. Um, this is going to be the name of the file that I'm going to write to. Uh, oh, you can also, you can edit a title and description. These are files in the um, vector field format, which is described in the user's guide if you want to know all the details on that. But I'm not going to save that right now. So I'm just going to close that. Um, if I do a, oh, and so over here now there's a schedule. 
I type send, it will send this output, the field. Actually, let's go through and just, let's just glance into magnetization. Okay, hang on a second. Sometimes you want to clear and then send. Um, if MMDIF has an image and it's been configured and you send another file to it, it tries to display it using the same configuration as it used for the last one. Uh, but the scale for the H field is different than the scale for the magnetization, and so it ended up being very small. So the easiest thing in that case is to do clear, to wipe out the current configuration, and then send it a fresh file. Um, I can schedule outputs. I do type send, that's interactive. It does it when I, it sends out the output immediately. Uh, if I do step, then every step in the iteration, it will send something out. That's usually too much, especially for vector field displays. So you can say every, every 10 or every 100. When I start to type in this box, it turns red. That means it's not been accepted yet, okay? You need to tab out or hit return in order to enter it, okay? Otherwise, it doesn't take, when you come back to it, it's got the old value. Um, you can output every stage. You can also output only when the program is done if you want. Um, someone was asking the other day about the difference between step, stage, and done, in particular, what is stage? So I was thinking about this a little bit, and it, uh, I think an analogy is, is a book where the step is the smallest unit of the book, it's a page, okay? So yeah, there's a lot going on in a page, there's lots of words which the solver takes care of, but the smallest piece that the solver can do, will, will report on is a step. So you say, take a step to the evolver, the Runga-Kutta evolver or the energy minimization evolver, and it does some work and then reports back and that's called a step, okay? Depending upon the evolver, there may be more or less work involved in doing a step. Uh, of course, the done is when the whole simulation is done. So that's the entire book. The stage is basically like the chapter. It's somewhat arbitrary in where you decide to break it up, but they're convenient points. And in particular, if you're doing, for example, a time integration problem, you can set a stage to occur every nanosecond or whatever time interval you want. And then if you turn off the stepping and you just have output on the stage, you get output every nanosecond or every you know, 100 picoseconds or whatever interval you want. That's very convenient if you want to take that information and then send it into doing like an FFT for spectral analysis because you want to have it even in intervals, okay? Uh, if you're doing a hysteresis loop, you typically, te you typically step the field, let the, let the simulation run until it reaches equilibrium state, and we call that a stage. And then to go to the next stage, um, you, you, the field steps. And so the stage uh, marks where the, the field changes, okay? Up here, the difference between one, run and relax and step. Step takes a single step. Relax runs until you get to the end of that current stage. Okay, and run starts running and when it gets to the stage, it just keeps going. Anything which has got any output scheduled on a stage will come out at that time, but the run just keeps going. Okay. Reset, resets the current um, problem, just goes back to the beginning. Reload, reloads the same problem by file, loads the same file and restarts. The difference between, difference between these two is if you edit the file, uh, if you do reset, you'll get the same program problem that you had before. It doesn't reread the file system. This really re reads the file system. Okay, I have a question up here. Is it possible to restart a simulation without the restart file? No, okay. The restart file, um, if, the program, if the problem is running, the, uh, yeah, so no. You need to have the restart file because that's what stores the information when, when OOF is down, okay. Um, okay, the zoom function in MMDISP. Uh, does oomph run when Windows is in sleep mode? No. If, it's, if Windows is sleeping, it's, oh, in sleep mode. Um, I'm not positive, actually. Someone should try that. Uh, are the Windows machines that we have at NIST, they're not allowed to sleep. It's cons we consider it to be a security issue because of the way that we do things. So our machines don't go into sleep. We go into hibernation mode. And hibernation mode, everything's on disk, it doesn't run. In sleep, it might. Um, so let's go back over to MMDisp. Okay, actually, actually, let me, um, uh, I'm having problems here because I can't get to the top of my window <laughs> uh, because of the stuff that um, uh, Zoom was putting up here. All right, there we go. Let me move this down a little bit. Working on a laptop, I don't have a lot of screen space to begin with, and then Zoom starts sticking up space, but okay. Um, okay, I'm going to run this for a little bit. 
and that's an output every hundred in every hundred steps. And you'll see that the configuration is changing as it relaxes into an equilibrium configuration. Okay. Well, another useful thing on Oxy is there's an about box here, which tells you various things about Oxy up front, but also the current simulation. This tells you how big the simulation is. Number of cells in the X and the Y in the Z direction, and the total number of cells. Well, it tells you where the checkpoint file is. Okay, so here's the restart file. That's exactly that's actually where it's where it is. Okay, so you can check to see if it's there. Um, this is where it's going to be. This one probably hasn't written a restart file yet. Uh, oh, I should mention the restart files. They are tied to the MIF file, and they have a little uh, checksum in them to make sure that they match the MIF file. In order to rerun a simulation, you need to have uh, the checkpoint file and the original MIF file. If you edit the MIF file, it won't, march, it won't match the restart file anymore, and Oxy will refuse to, to load the restart file. Um, there are maybe some ways around that if you're really desperate, but um, mostly no. Okay, so this is now, this simulation only had a single stage, so when I type relax, that was actually, it was actually the same as done. This is the final configuration that it has. Now, uh, to zoom. So let's go up here. Uh, so subsampling. So this is not every pixel in this, every arrow in the simulation, right? Uh, by default, auto sample is on and it picks a number which seems reasonable for the display size. Okay, but if I want to, I can turn off auto sample and I can change it to make it make it coarser subsampling, which will display faster. MMDIS is kind of slow. It's an old program. Um, I should say some more about that later. Uh, but especially for really big simulations, it can be slow. And what's slow is how many things it has to render. So if you increase the subsample number, it will display faster. Of course, you get less resolution. Um, and if you put down to zero, then it displays every all, all the arrows, which you, as you can see here, it's a little hard to see. And that's why that went to two. Uh, the data scale. Um, so what that does, is um, there's a color map. Actually, let me. If you set the data scale to zero, then it automatically scales. Let me pull up the options dialog here. You can also, some of these, everything is, all the configurations in this configure dialog, uh, this sort of header here shows you, gives you a subsample of some of it. Uh, you can actually turn that control bar off if you're short on space. Um, that's less important these days than it used to be, but on laptops it's still convenient sometimes. Um, you can, you have control over the color map. So this is a red, uh, black, blue color map for low to high. And this, and then the, qu the quantity that you want to color. So right now I'm coloring the Z component of the magnetization. If I switch to X and I hit apply, then it changes and it shows the X component. So these vectors are pointing to the left, so they're red. Uh, and I don't have anything pointing to the right, which would be blue. Although I can reverse the color map if I want, in which case blue points to the left. Uh, and this is also reflected up in this little window here. You can also do something like color the angle, okay? Um, now for the angles, angle ones, these are on, on, a, on a circle. And so you probably want a color map, one of these two at the bottom. Which um, are circular, red, green, blue, red, or a sign. Okay, those show arrows. If you want to, you can turn on pixels. Um, which instead of drawing an arrow or in addition, you have it both in, in, uh, turned on, will color the, the pixels underneath. They tend to have um, the auto sample feature sizes things so that they're visible. Okay, you need to have a fair number of pixels in order to display an arrow. So the subsampling, the automatic subsampling rate for arrows tends to be bigger than for pixels. And so if you have a large simulation and you enable pixels, that may slow down a lot because there are a lot more pixels. The grayed out color here is how many are being displayed. That's a subsample rate, okay? So if I turn off the, the auto on that and kick that up to two, for example, and then hit apply, then you see it gets blockier, okay? Because now I'm only seeing every other one. And another cute trick you can do is, this is the size. So you can change the size of the arrows if you think they're too small. This is especially useful uh, next week when we talk about presenting, making um, pictures out of your simulations. Changing the size for a good presentation and also the subsampling is something you frequently want to do. 
On the pixels, though, if I change the size to say something like 0.5, then it draws the pixel smaller. And this is kind of useful if you wanted to see exactly where the pixels are, right, where the cells are. This gives you the cells, okay? Um, the data scale basically stretches or shrinks the color map. That's what that does. The zoom function just does what its name implies. It just makes it bigger or smaller. That makes it smaller. If I make it bigger, it was at 10 before. If I make it 20, then it zooms in quite a bit. I can't even see the whole thing, but I have uh, scroll bars here so I can scroll up and down, okay? Uh, if you set this to equal to zero, oh, I thought that worked, I guess it doesn't, okay. Um, there are some keyboard shortcuts. If you type home, then it will rescale um, the display. It will do rescale the zooming so that it just fits the window, whatever the window size is. Uh, this is a three-dimensional problem. Uh, this is a cube, and this slice allows you to go back, goes through the different uh, slices, gives you cross sections. Okay, in this case, it's going. I'm displaying the xy plane, and so it's moving. It's slicing through the z direction. Okay, there is under the view menu there is a viewpoint option, which instead of seeing it from the z, displaying the xy, seeing from the z axis, you can look at it from say the x axis. Um, in which case now I'm looking at the x-axis set on. Okay, let me go back up here. Let me change the background. Y. Okay, so now you can see in this box, you can see Y is up and Z is to the left, and then I'm looking down the x-axis. And this allows you to get slices along that axis, okay? So you can change those around. Um, the zoom functionality, you can type in an exact value here, there's also a little trick where if you click and drag, you get this red box, red box will pop up. And what happens when I release the cursor here, it's going to zoom up to the, that region, the region right inside there is what's displayed. And so you can see there, okay? The escape key will undo that last zoom. Uh, another thing you can do, which is less useful if I zoom in, but instead of doing a drag with the left mouse button, I do a drag with the right mouse button. I'll get a blue box. And what happens in that case is everything gets uh, crunched down to fit into that. So it's an inverse function. So it de-zooms, okay? That one's much less helpful. Uh, I'm going to type um, home again to rescale it. Under view, there's also some other options. Um, wrap display and fill display. If I, um, if I make my window bigger, if I can grab it, Maybe I can't. We used to have uh, borders on windows. We don't do that anymore. If I make this larger, and if I hit fill, it will expand it isometrically as large as it can. It still fit in the, the viewing window. Uh, what wrap does is it takes whatever zoom that you have and expands and contracts the window as necessary to just fit it. Okay. Um, so if I if I go here, for example, and I set the zoom to two, and then I were to do a wrap, I get a pretty small window. If I make this larger, it doesn't fill anymore. If I do wrap, it then expand, expands it, okay? Be a little bit careful with wrap. If you've got a really high zoom, you try to wrap, it will try to make it a fill a whole window. Um, is it possible to configure a default MIF configuration? I mean, what is the meaning of, okay. Uh, yes, I, yes I, there is a configuration file. Um, and you can set up, when you're trying to make pictures in particular, one of the things that you do is, one of the ways to go about it is you play around with your image in MMDisp until it looks nice. And then you write that config out, right? You write out that configuration. And then you can use that configuration when you go to convert the uh, OMF file into, a PNG file or something like that. You can also use that configuration file. You can set it up as a default configuration file for MMDesk if you want to do that. There should be instructions in the manual on that, okay? I'll probably say some more about this when we get to that in a later session. Uh, what is the meaning of Z-slice? I think I covered that. Uh, it's giving you, you're not saying that this is a 3D simulation, it's a cube. And as you change the slice, in this case, it's X slice because I changed the view direction. It's giving you different cross sections as you move through. 
Um, yeah, how to undo the selection. Uh, I'm not sure what they mean by selection. Escape uh, on MM Disp undoes the last zoom. Uh, oh, uh, so you have to check to see which box has the cursor at con at currently. It's currently in the zoom box. So if I move, if I, if I hit tab, it'll move to the next one, and then next one, the next one after that is this display window. Uh, a lot of the keyboard shortcuts that you want, you need to have this as being the focus of the of the um, of the keyboard sequence. Otherwise, if you're if you're in this box, you hit home, it goes to the beginning of that widget, but not resizing this display. Okay, and whether or not the escape key works will depend upon whether or not it's still storing the display. Sometimes it works. Some, it's it's a little bit. I'm sorry, it's a little bit flaky. Um. Okay. See if there's anything else I need to do here. Um, let me clear that. I'm going to just restart it. Close this. I think that's enough time on this widget. Okay. Um, let's move on. So that's vector field displays. The other common type of display outputs are going to be things involving data or scalar values. So the most sim the simplest widget for that is the data widget uh, and then data table. And if you click on data right now, it doesn't show anything. Okay. If I go back to Oxy and I select data table output, over here on the destination, it lists me everything that's currently running that I can send data to. Right now, data table. I'll get back to MM Archive at the end. But it's got the same sort of scheduling, step, stage, done. I'm going to send data to it right now. Once I do that, um, this menu item, which is things that you want to display, auto configures, okay? So for example, maybe I want to know what the iteration number is, and then that comes up. Uh, if I want to know how many, how many times have I evaluated uh, the anisotropy energy? I'm sorry, hang on, that's the wrong one. Um, let's look at the total energy count. You know, energy cal count. That's the number of times that the energy terms have been calculated. This is the uh, total uh, uni uniaxial anisotropy energy in joules for the entire volume. Okay, that's sort of these sorts of things. Now on Windows and Linux, you can you'll see there's a little dashed line here at the top. You can click on that dashed line, and this menu comes off. And that's convenient if you want to select a bunch of different things at once, for example, okay? And when you're done, you can just say X, and it goes away, all right? Uh, in data table, you can select things like this, and then if you do Control C or you go down to copy, it will copy that into the clipboard so you can copy into other programs. If you right click on this, uh, you get a little format dialog, which, uh, which allows you to put in a C style printf statement printf uh, command to format the output. So for example, if I want to do 0 0.3, three dec uh, floating, right, fixed point, 3.3, three, th three things to the right of the decimal point, I can do that. You can also justify whether you want it left or right or centered in the field. Um, and, uh, oh, if you click all, then it clicks all of them instead of just the ones that are highlighted. There's also an option for long names. Right now, it just says MX, MY, MZ. When I click OK here, I'll get actually the full name for the output, which includes the uh, OXS EXT module, the class which produced it. Okay, so this output is coming from the min driver. And you see now I have three decimal places here. Um, for the energy, I frequently want to use uh, an exponential format. And let's say, looks like four digits, E. Okay, and then it displays like that. And that's pretty much all there is about the data widget. This is pretty basic, okay? Um, oh, is there a 3D view option, option for MMDisp? Uh, no, um, that's one of the things that we're working on and I will show you a little bit uh, about some stuff we have on that. If you, save the, if you save the files though, you can, there are, there are there are programs around, including an OMF, which will do some conversion for you. You can convert it to another format and bring it into something like MATLAB or um, ParaView and things like this. 
So um, yeah, there are ways to get 3D views of these things, but they're not in the, they're not currently in them proper. Okay. All right. So let's go on to the next widget, which is the graph widget. Oh man, goodness, time flies. Um, this is like MMDisp. It takes I'm sorry, MM data table. It takes um, data table, scalar data output. Again, here you select graph. I'm going to select every step. Let me reset this run and then run. And every step is going to come out to NM graph. Okay. Um, here again, like in data table, these things auto configure. Uh, if I type uh, iteration and I type, say, MX, which is the average M value, lowercase means it's been normalized to one. And you can see it goes from zero to 0 0.2 here. And um, the, I got two axes, all right? And so I can select multiple items for Y1 and Y2. Okay, if you grab, you can grab and drag this uh, legend if you want. You can also turn it off, turn off the key if you want. Um, so the blue and the green here are, dis are displaying on the right menu. They go from minus 0.2 to here. This, the red one's going over here. And if I just run this thing, it will auto resize as necessary. Um, there are a bunch of options here in the config dialog for it. Uh, if you're running on the OOMPH2 branch, you can also make log axes, um, which not terribly useful for this, but if you're looking at um, time step or something like that, the log axes are kind of nice. Um, it actually is a log value of the absolute value of the quantity, and it throws out zeros. So. Um, Oh, if you're doing multiple runs, you can select segment. And then what happens is when you get a new run, I have to apply. If I do a new run, which I'll just rerun this, and do a run, then the next run comes through. I don't know if you can see that very well. It's a little thin here. The next run comes in in a different color. So if you're tweaking some parameter, you want to see how it varies from one run to the next. That's sort of a convenient thing to do in MM graph. Okay. You can save all the data that's stored in a graph if you want to. And there are other ways to do this using a archive, um, but that it can be convenient sometimes. And if you use this and if you want to, you can save just the data which is currently being displayed. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, one other thing here, an MM graph. It used to be a big deal. It's less these days, but uh, you can change the size of the curve. Okay, if I do this and the curves get thicker. Symbol frequency, by default, you, it doesn't mark a symbol for the, the point, but you can enable that on if you want. And you can display how frequently you want to put them like that. You can change the size of the symbol. But what I wanted to mention was a point buffer size. By default, MM graph saves every, all the data that, it, that you send it. You do a really long simulation, you send lots of data, uh, that can take up some memory. And um, if you want to trim how much memory is saved, this is how many the previous points that you saved. So if you want to, you could set it to something like 10,000. And then it, would, it wouldn't eat up all your memory if you're doing a really long run. But the default is zero, which means to save everything. Oh, is there a, yeah, there, in the manual, it does list all the keyboard shortcuts. Okay, that was a question. Uh, are there, how do you know what the keyboard shortcuts are for these things? And they are described in the manual. I will warn you that some of them will involve things like a uh, control key, which may not go through a web browser if you're working on NanoHub. I haven't done very much testing on NanoHub. So some of the keyboard shortcuts there may be intercepted by, the, by your browser and won't work. So um, if that's a big problem, let me know. We can try to find some workaround. Okay, and then just to fidget, finish the widget, oh, almost finished the widget demo. The last one up here I want to talk about is MM Archive. This, um, and this also is one of these deals where you can bring up and bring down a display. All the display does is it tells you what it's done. Uh, and so uh, when I loaded this problem by default, it's sending output to uh, MM Archive and um, writes it out. Um, geez, this is a little bit of a problem. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the archive widget writes to disk. So this is the main thing that you actually want to be using for saving your data. So you're going to be opening this a lot anytime you're doing a real run. And the archive widget will show up under data table or any of the field values you'll see. I actually got a couple of them up here. And you can send different data to different ones. Well, up in the left-hand corner, there'll be a number. 
okay? Uh, that number corresponds to every application that you run, um, an OOMF gets a OID, an OOMF ID number, um, which it has, there's a one-to-one -one mapping to the PIDs. Uh, there's a way to get a hold of the, the PID if you need that for some reason. Um, but basically, when you do a run, you say, okay, I want to save uh, data table output, and when I write it to desk, I want to do it every stage, okay? And it will create a file. That's the name of the file there. The name of the file is pretty predictable. Um, and it will do that. The data table output all goes out into one single file, which gets closed when you exit the, when you finish the simulation, or if you quit prematurely, whatever, it writes out what it has. Data, uh, MM archive gets data, from Oxy and stores it and then dumps it. It actually writes it out as it goes along and then closes the file at the end. If you send a vector field file like uh, the magnetization or the energy density or anything like that, that gets written out. Let me do one of those. Let's write out the magnetization. Let's write it out to this one, number six. So there's 6.2, so six. Don't worry about the colon two business. That's a little bit detail in the weeds there. But if I type send here, you'll see the MMR archive writes up and says here, okay, I'm writing this out. And that's, that's where it went to, okay? So that's how you get output from the programs. Okay, where is the meaning of colors in minimum disk? Those are the color map. Um, they, you can set them up. I'm sorry, if I look to the side, it means I'm reading a question. But uh, the question came across, where, where's the meaning of the colors? And again, just to recap, if you pull up the configured dialog, uh, there's a color quantity that you can select for the arrows and for the pixels. You can select them independently. And there, you can select the X component of, the, of wherever the field is, the Y component, the Z component. Slice has to do with, um, with this, this is the slice width, the slice, you can, the cross section. Okay, so you can color based on the cross section if you wanna do that. Um, and then there's uh, the magnitude that maps, it just computes the magnitude of, of the vector and um, displays that. You can also measure, also map the color in the XY plane, the XZ plane or the YZ plane. Oh, divergence. Uh, this will compute. This will uh, color based on the divergence, which is kind of convenient in many applications, um, or none. If you don't want to, if you don't want the things colored at all, you can collect none. And then the map that which is used, I mean, the smallest values. Uh, so these read from smallest values to highest values. So you can go from red to black to blue, smallest values, possibly negative, up to largest values, and there are different color maps. Okay, um, not too much to see there but you can select them. And if you want a different color map, they're easy to add new ones, actually. Um, I'm not sure if that's described or not in the um, user's guide, but it's, it's easy to do. If you need to do that, let me know. Okay, any other questions? Is it possible to write the data table with short names instead through a MEF file? Um, I'm not quite seeing it. Yes, you should be. Okay, so the question is, is it possible to write the data table output with short names instead of long times to MM archives? Well, um, through MM, the MIF file. Okay, so if you're talking about data table output, all the scalars, currently uh, pretty much everything gets written out. You don't have a, you don't, for the most part, you don't have control over, there's a small caveat, but it's an advanced issue. Pretty much everything goes to the output file, um, and there's a lot of them. There is a program called uh, ODT calls. It's a command line program, which will allow you to thin out the data. Uh, and, but it does go out with the full name. Um, in terms of selection, you don't typically need to use the full name to select stuff in the MIF file, uh, as long as it's unique. Um, but um, that's the status of things. Is it possible to graph contour maps of the magnetostatic stray field directly, or need to use another program? Yeah, we don't have any support in OOMF to do contour maps. You have to export it to another program. But that's fairly straightforward. For each data function, do I need a separate MM archive? No, you do not. In an MM archive, you can send as much to as you want, um, and it will send it all out. But if you want different schedules, um, primarily that's for data table. If I want to put out, um, Sometimes I want to have two data tables, uh, one which is like every, every tenth iteration and one which is every stage. Maybe I'm going to use the stage for some uh, spectrum analysis. In that case, you need to have two MMR archives. Um, but for the vector fields, they just get written out. And so you can, 
can do that with one if you want. Okay, um, just one last thing I want to mention briefly. Oh, two things, okay. One is there are two other buttons on here, MMSolve2D, that's a 2D solver. It's obsolete, there's no reason to use it. I should remove it from the list. I'm not gonna go into that today. There's also problem add. This is a problem editor that we wrote for the 2D uh, solver, and that's what it's aimed at. It produces output files for the 2D solver. Uh, they're quite different than the 3D solver. Um, they're not nearly as flexible, but you can edit things in here. And you can specify uh, material constants, but only one each. Um, an isotropy uh, type of DMAG, whether you want DMAG or not, basically. Uh, the part size and things like this. Um, and then you can save it to file and then you can bring it back in. It's actually not a bad, I should mention the Oxy, the 3D solver will read these files. Okay, so you can work with these files if they meet your needs. Under options, there is a MIF 1.2. So the MIF files, there's a one, ver one versions, one point versions of the MIF files and a two point versions. The 3D solver, the new one uses a two point and they're technical files. I'm, I'm trying to get to that as fast as I can. Um, you can't go from you can't go from those files back to this to one format, but you can go from the one format to the two format. There's a command line program called MIF convert that can do that. Um, also, Oxy will read these files directly. But in addition to the MIF 1.1, which is a format for the 2D solver, there's a MIF 1.2, which is sort of straddles the line between the two of them, and it's set up to work a little bit better with the 3D solver. In particular, you can select whether you want to do energy minimization or time integration. Um, you can select the cell size X, Y, and Z separately. Um, so you can have multiple layers. And so this, this does a little bit, this is a fair amount of stuff. Sometimes I will use problem editor to create a template for uh, my 3D file. I'll save it as 1.2 format, and then I'll use MIF convert to make it into a 3D file, and then I'll edit from there. Okay, the last thing I want to say on the, um, on the widget demo, which I forgot to mention before, under Oxy, um, well, there's a clear schedule option. It, sometimes if you load lots of, if you set up a lot of schedule stuff, you load a new, pro, new file, the old schedule sticks around and that may not be what you want. So you can hit this to clear any existing schedule and start over. But in particular, I wanted to uh, mention the checkpoint control. So these are the files which get written up to disk in order to allow you to restart the simulation if it crashes, okay? So this is a little control which, a uh, little dialog which allows you to change the default values if you want. Um, so this is how often it gets written out. It will only get written out after a step has been done. So if you've paused the simulation, you change this, it's not gonna write anything out until a step is complete, okay? And then the other question is, well, okay, I've finished my run. I had this checkpoint file. Um, it writes one checkpoint file as it goes along. So if there's a checkpoint file, then you get to another 15 minute interval or write out another checkpoint file. If that write-out is successful, then it will move the new one over the old one. So there's typically only one checkpoint file around it at any time. When you get to the end of the simulation, what should you do with that checkpoint file? And that's what the disposal does. The standard disposal method is if you've get, gotten to the end of the simulation successfully, then it will automatically delete the checkpoint uh, file when you exit the program. Um, or if you're running and you're in the middle of the run, but you go up here and you say, okay, I want to exit. So if the user specifies that you want to exit the simulation, that's again a controlled shutdown. It says, okay, I don't need to keep the checkpoint file and we'll delete it, okay? Um, if you want to, you can select done only, in which case if you exit uh, Oxy in a controlled fashion, meaning, well, I'm going to go under the file and do an exit, it will not clean up the checkpoint file if you have done only. It'll only exit it, it'll only delete it if you've gotten all the way to the end of the simulation, okay? So if you want to do controlled shutdown, but you still wanna pick up where you left off, you can do that. Um, I think it actually saves, when you do that, I think it saves the very last state uh, as part of the shutdown process. Or you can select never, in which case the checkpoints stay around and they never get deleted automatically the, by the program, in which case they will build up over time. They can be large, so you may want to check occasionally and remove the old restart files, okay? Um, okay, one of the questions coming up is, how can one generate a color bar corresponding to the color map? 
uh, yeah, there's a way to do this. Um, and I would go over that when I discuss how you create present, how you create images for presentation. Okay. I don't have, I'm already, I'm already past the hour mark and I haven't even gotten to the MIF files yet. So I'm going to move on. Um, let's go back to my presentation here. Okay, so that's the widget overview. Whew. Oh, there was a question about 3D uh, imaging of um, the MIF file, of the OMF files, of the vector field files. There is a group at NIST which specializes in 3D visualization, and I am currently working with them, trying, hoping to get some, something that um, will be able to do this and bring it to the desktop. Um, this uh, is an example. One of the problems with 3D visualization is if you just draw all the arrows, you can't make it heads or tails out of it very easily. And so I was trying to figure out how to make convenient cut planes um, and other sorts of highlighting so you can see what the important features are. But this is an example. Um, this is actually that cube that I was showing in, in, during the widget. This is standard problem number three. Uh, this is a size cube so that you've got a, a vortex core in the middle. You can, if you look closely, you can sort of see that the magnetization sort of um, curls around as it goes up. Uh, the color coding here is divergence. So there's uh, flux going in here and flux going out at the top. Okay, this particular, in this particular uh, application, you can rotate things around so you can see it from different angles and stuff like that. This is actually done in what we call the cave. This is an interactive environment. And so that's actually me there. And you can go in and you can actually walk inside the data and, and try to see what's going on. Um, so I'm working with them and I don't know if there's going to be anything coming out of this or not, but um, I'm hoping that it will. Uh, MMDisp is quite long in the tooth and I would like to find something uh, which is faster and uh, fully 3D, but I don't have that yet. Okay, let's move forward. MIF files. Okay, uh, so this is what your standard 3D input file looks like, okay? Uh, the very first line says MIF 2.1. So the two point series is our input files for the 3D solver for Oxy and Boxy, okay? And I've color coded these. Um, this is actually a tickle file. When you go to edit these things, you, if you pull it into your favorite code ed editor, so the plain text editor. So that can be notepad, but it's better to use something which is, um, it's more, it's easier to write if you do, the, do this editing in a coding editor. So notepad plus plus is a good free one, which is on Windows. I personally use Emacs. Um, if you go to NanoHub, I had them recently install something called Genie on the, on the OOF um, uh, widget. And if you go into Genie, it will load your MIF file and uh, do co color code stuff, so it makes it a little bit easier to see, okay? If you do use a, a, a source code editor like C++, um, you want to set your file type uh, to tickle, okay? Because these are basically tickle files. Okay, let me go to the next slide where I've uh, annotated this a bit. Okay, so the very first line on your, your MIF file has to be this header line, okay? I should mention that the, um, the pound symbol, that's uh, denotes a comment in tickle, okay? So these are tickle files, the MIF files are tickle files with some extension commands, okay? So at the top here I have, you see anything that's in orange is a tickle command. So there's a set command, uh, which, and that's a variable. Uh, I'll get the tickle in a minute. Uh, I have another slide that describes tickle a little bit. But this basically computes, this expression here computes pi using another tickle command, expr, stores it in the variable pi. And this is optional, but it's sometimes convenient uh, down here if you wanna do some scaling to have mu naught in particular. And so this computes mu naught, okay? And then I can set some default values that I wanna use elsewhere in the program. The, uh, I don't know, what color is that, mauve or something, lavender? Those are extension commands. Um, uh, those are MIF extension commands to tickle. So they're not in tickle, they're in MIF files. And I colored them here so you can pick them out. They're also uppercase. So parameter is like a set command. It sets this um, variable to this value. But the thing about the command line, about the parameter command is uh, it, you can change it from the command line when you launch the, pro, launch the simulation. Or also if you're loading from Oxy, there's that parameter uh, op line in the dialog box. So this, these are values which you can change on a run-by-run -run basis, okay? If you change them, you sort of have to keep track that you change them though in terms of the output. 
Um, there are ways it's supposed to change the output name. I'm not going to get into that today, but you should try to keep track of that. Uh, okay, so here's, um, okay. Let me back, go back a step here. Uh, so that's what, those are commands. Uh, these guys here, anytime you see a specify command, this is the main command in setting up your MIF files. This specifies what modules you're going to be loading into your simulation. Okay? So you need to only specify an atlas, which describes the space that you're going to be simulating. Okay? So these distances are in meters. The X range, this is a rectangular parallelopiped, uh, which is a simulation volume. Okay? So zero to three nanometers and so on. You have to have at least one atlas. Sometimes it's convenient to have more. Okay? Um, the specify command, uh, this first bit here, everything up to the colon, that's the class name. If you go into the OOMF user's guide, uh, there's a section where it lists all the different classes which are available and documents them. I'll show you that maybe in a bit. There's an optional colon and then another name, which is an instance name. This is a name that you just make up. It's uh, for reference elsewhere in the MIF file. Uh, in general, you can have as many of each with a couple of exceptions I'll get to. You can have as many of each class as you want, provided that they have different instance names. So if I wanted to have another atlas, if it was another box atlas, I'd have to give it a different name. If you don't do that, when you go to load the MIF file, you'll get an error message that comes up and says, uh, I've got two of these guys, fix it, okay? So the atlas describes the simulation volume. The mesh describes how it's discretized, okay? And so for the mesh, you have to specify which atlas, because there can be more than one, that you want to discretize. And then these are the cell sizes. This is a finite difference um, simulation. And so there's just one X size, one X Y size, and one Z size. It, it you know, discretizes into, into rectangular solids. Okay, um, only one mesh per simulation. And then the energy terms, okay? So there's exchange coupling, there's DMAG field, uh, an applied field, and there are a raft of these. If you go into the user's guide, there's a list of a bunch of them. You include as many of them as you want. You can repeat them if you want. Sometimes it's convenient in, in, in anisotropy to have different types of anisotropy, having more than one uniaxial anisotropy. You can do that, whatever's convenient. Just remember that if you have more than one of the same type, same class, you need to put a colon in a unique instance name. Um, vector fields. So um, in terms of the OXS EXT objects, which are uh, created by specify commands in the MIF file, there are energies, there's atlases, there's meshes, there's evolvers, those step the, uh, the simulation from one step to the next. There's a driver which controls the evolver, and there are fields. So fields are the scalar fields and vector fields. Um, they are pointwise functions. So the vector field at every point in the simulation, which in practice, in principle, well, in practice, which means the center of each of these cells from your mesh, uh, a vector field assigns a 3D vector, okay? If you have a scalar field, it assigns a scalar value to each point in the simulation. And those are used, these vector fields, these don't affect the simulation directly, but they're used by, they're used to initialize um, the other objects. So for example, in the driver, in this case, I'm using the time driver, which is an OXS EXT object. You see the specify there. Um, I have to specify the initial magnetization configuration, okay? Now, so lowercase m, this means that's unit vectors I have to give it. If you give it anything that's not a unit vector, it automatically normalizes it to one. If you give it a zero, it ends up giving you a random value. So don't do that. Um, and it takes a vector field value here. Yeah. So uh, it gives you a vector, it needs a vector field value. In that case, I'm going, I'm specifying the vector field M underscore a net, okay, which is a short name. And um, if I had, okay, so I can use, there's nowhere else in the program do I have anything using that name, M underscore a net. So I don't have to specify the full name. The full name would be OXS underscore file vector field colon M underscore a net. You can use that too if you want. But it will use this vector field to initialize the initial magnetization. One of the vector field types is a uniform vector field, which is just the same one value skewed across the entire area, okay? If you go down in here and I were to specify a three vector, um, like here, just curly braces and three values, then that would default back to a uniform, 
vector field. And so it would just be that one value. So MS here, right above it, you see MS. I just have a number here, okay? MS also takes, it takes a scalar vector field, okay? If I wanted to vary MS spatially, I'd have to create another scalar vector, I'd have to create a scalar field, excuse me, a scalar field that shows what the variation is. If I'm, if I'm fine with just having a constant value, I can just write the constant in. But behind the scenes, what it really does is it creates a scalar vector field and sticks uh, AE5 in for everything. Um, Okay, question. Is it possible to vary cell size and isotropy in exchange from one cell to another? You cannot vary the cell size. Uh, it's a finite difference scheme. We, use, we need that in order to do the FFT to compute the DMAG field primarily. So the cell size is fixed inside the mesh, and uh, at least currently there's only one mesh, so only one cell size. However, the other quantities, the anisotropy, the exchange, and so on, these, um, the anisotropy is I did not include an anisotropy here, but the anisotropy, both the, uh, the coefficient k and the axis directions, those are set by fields, okay? So vector fields or scalar fields, um, and they can vary point by point. So you can vary uh, the anisotropy, uh, the applied field, the magnetization, um, you can vary all those point-wise. Exchange also can be varied point-wise. It's a little bit more complicated because it involves two members. Uh, exchange works across pairs. You can also vary that across the simulation. And there are a number of different exchange energies that you can select from, which allow you to vary it in different ways. Okay. How to set different Gilbert damping constants in different areas uh, is the question. Go in here for the Runge Kutta uh, solver. Uh, I didn't put any parameters in here. The parameters inside the specified block typically have the form um, label and then a value. Okay. Uh, so in this case, the value is two values, but it's in cur closed in curly braces, so it's a single value. Uh, they all of this form. There are defaults for lots of things. If you go into the documentation for the Evolver, in particular Runga Kutta Evolver, it gives you a long list of all the options and what the default values are. One of the default, one of the values in there that you can change is alpha. And so you can set a value for alpha to be whatever you want. And that value for alpha, it's actually a scalar field. So you can create a scalar field object and have the, uh, the damping changed however you want across the simulation. Uh, that's especially useful if you're doing some sort of simulation, you've got spin waves, and you don't want them to bounce off the edges. You can put a high damping on the edge to absorb the spin waves. Uh, I am, let's see, DMAG is not specified here. What does it mean? Uh, there is DMAG, it's right here, okay? Uh, DMAG, uh, there are a few options, although typically you don't use them. The DPEG, the DMAG is um, determined, controlled by the MS point to point. So the DMAG computes the dipole interaction between every pair of cells. Uh, the strength of that interaction depends upon the distance and the magnetization, the MS at each, at each point. Um, and if you include this line, specify Alexis DMAG, then you get that energy in the simulation. If you leave it out, then there's no DMAG. What does subst mean? Yeah. Um, I have a slide on tickle stuff. I think I will delay that. I'm going to keep going. Um, push through the end here. I'm good. I've got coffee. Let's see. What's the next slide here? Okay, so let me just go briefly go through the classes and then I'll go through tickle a little bit uh, to tell you about subst and things like this. Okay, so these are not all the classes. If you go to the user's guide, it lists all the classes. Um, List all the classes in the standard oomph um, distribution, aside from the contrib objects. Uh, contrib objects are additional classes. You need to uh, follow the links to um, the maintainers of those classes to find the documentation which tells you about those. But in terms of atlases, the most basic one, which I showed on the previous slide, is the box atlas. You just give it two corners of, of a rectangular region, and that becomes your atlas. Um, there's a multi-atlas which allows you to put together a bunch of different atlases. Um, and so you can put any atlases in there that you want. There's a script atlas. Uh, for the script atlas, you write a little tickle routine, which given a point, assigns a number to it. And that number is gonna be the region. And so you can use a script to break up uh, the volume into any way that you want. It's, uh, it's, it's tickle script. So all the sorts of things that you have in a programming language, you can use to specify regions. It's very powerful. 
you do need to learn how to write tickle in order to do this, but uh, it's a, usually a very short proc that you need for this. There is an image atlas. You can bring in an image and use that, use the colors in the image to specify regions, okay? And so uh, that's also a very powerful technique. Um, if you want, like to draw or you've got a micrograph or something that you can maybe use to create different, different regions, okay? Um, and you can have multiple atlases in a simulation for different purposes. Uh, you need to have one for the mesh, um, but there's also, for example, boundary conditions. If you want to fix spins in some part of the simulation or on the boundary or in the middle, you may want to write a separate atlas just to handle the edges, okay? And then when you, when you put in the fixed spins, you specify you want to use that atlas in these particular regions. Um, Okay, one of the questions coming up is, are the five standard problems solved by MUMEG the same as those in the OOMF examples file? Yes, they are, okay? So that's a, that's a good point. If you go to the MUMEG page, you can see the solutions and you can go and you can try to uh, duplicate those solutions from the example MIF files and you can go in and play with those. That's a good, point, good way to start. Um, moving on to meshes. You have to have one mesh, exactly one mesh per simulation. Currently, there are two meshes. There's a rectangular mesh, which is the main one, okay? And then there's a periodic rectangular mesh, which is the same thing, but with periodic boundary conditions. Where periodic means along the X, Y, and or Z axes, okay? Um, the DMAG, the current DMAG does um, non-periodic boundary conditions by default, uh, or it can do 1D periodic. Currently, OXS DMAG does 1D periodic uh, boundary conditions along X axis, Y axis, or Z axis. Uh, hopefully this summer I will finish up the 2D periodic DMAG and then you'll be able to do 2D uh, periodic boundary conditions as well. Okay, so there's the meshes. I talked about scalar fields and vector fields. There's a bunch of them, okay? These are ways how you vary, these allow you to vary properties um, point-wise, um, uh, spatially, okay? And there's a bunch of them. The uniform is the simplest one. You just give it a single value and it goes everywhere. But you can vary the, uh, can, you can create a scalar field or a vector field uh, here, which is varies depending upon different regions in the atlas. So if you've got a more complicated atlas with multiple regions, you can assign values based on the region. You can also create a scalar field where um, the values are, very, are determined by a little tickle script that you write. The script is given a point as to output a value. There's random vector fields. So that should say random scalar field, I think, but um, there's also random vector fields. Um, oh, there's also some uh, routines which allow you the script scalar field in particular, the script vector field in particular. These guys actually, in terms of inputs, you know, they get a point for some point in the simulation, but you can also feed in other scalar fields and other vector fields. So you can use the script scalar field and script vector field to actually combine uh, vector fields by adding them together or multiplying or anything that you can do in Tickle, right? So that's very powerful also. Um, you can import images as the basis for your scalar field. You can also, this one's very useful here actually. Uh, frequently it's a case where we're running a simulation. The very first step of the simulation is to relax an equilibrium state. And you wanna use energy minimization for that because it's fast. And then you want part B of the simulation to be, as in the homework today, uh, to be a dynamic simulation. And you want that one to start with the last one finished. So what you do is you do the first simulation doing energy minimization. You save the final state, and then for the part B, you use OXS file vector field to load that state as your initial configuration. Um, you go back here, M not in that case would be a file vector field with the name of that file as the initial configuration. Um, okay, energy terms. There's a bunch of energy terms. You include as many of these as you want. An isotropy, there's DMAG, there's applied field, uh, different ways of applying field, a bunch of different exchange ones. Oh, there's two surface exchange. Um, so you use this when you have, when you wanna have exchange coupling between two cells which are non-adjacent. So you use this, for example, if you have a copper spacer, you have two layer, you have multiple layer film, you've got like a copper spacer, and you wanna have coupling between the lower and upper film, okay, KY coupling, that sort of thing. That's what you use this class for. Um, there's a DM exchange six neighbor. This is the DMI interaction. This is a third party extension. It should not be labeled OXS. Um, I want to ask three party, third party extensions. You notice all of these energies, they all start with all the specified blocks, all the OXS EXT objects. They begin with OXS underscore. 
that's a convention that I like that I use for all of the extensions that I write that are parts of OOMP standard. I asked uh, third party contributors to create their own, come up with their own prefix, just so we don't have any name collisions. Okay, so I would prefer that this has something other than LXS and prefix. I'm mentioning that to you. If you write your own extension, come up with your own extension. It could be whatever prefix, whatever it is, just so we don't have collisions between the base classes and third party extensions. Okay. Um, Okay, um, evolvers. Okay, the CG evolve, this is a conjugate gradient minimization evolver. That's the one you should be using for energy minimization. It needs to be paired with the min driver, okay? I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, if you're integrating, if you're doing a time integration of LLG, you should use the Runga Kutta evolve, uh, which is a Runga Kutta um, integration. Uh, if you're doing spin torque, there are a few options. One of them is this one from IBM and Zurich. Uh, it's actually layered on top of the Runga Kutta Evolve. So it's another Runga Kutta software, but it includes spin torque, okay? Both of these guys, they go with the time driver. Um, the main difference between the min driver and the time driver is the time driver is integrating out LLG, and so it has a sense of time. It's been running for some period of, you know, five nanoseconds or whatever, and it can tell these classes up here what the time index is. And you need that, for example, for scripts sometimes. They need to know the time index. If you're applying a pulse, you need to know what the time is. You know whether the, the applied field is strong or low and that sort of stuff. The min driver is from energy minimization. It doesn't have any concept of time, okay? And so it has different controls uh, than the time driver. And so that's why we have this dichotomy between the min driver and the time driver. Uh, some point in not too distant future, I may write a, a multi-driver, which will allow you to, to do both of these and allow you to combine uh, minimization and uh, integration in the same simulation, but it's not there currently. Um, okay, so here's, here's a brief introduction, introduction to Tickle, and I'll get to the subs command here. Um, so this is what Tickle, this is, I opened up a Tickle shell and I ran some commands. And this is what, if you open up Tickle, you can type these things in and you might wanna play with this yourself. Uh, here's the annotated version. Uh, in Tickle, um, you basically write a command on one line. Uh, the first thing happens is the Tickle parser comes through and it splits on white space, okay? So this particular line, I've got three words, set, and then break, because I have white space, A, break, and then five, okay? So there are three words here. Tickle always interprets the first word as the command, in this case, the Tickle set command. Everything after that is arguments to that command, okay? So the set command, expects the first thing to be a variable name that's going to store the value in. And then the third, then the second argument, the third word is going to be the value which is stored in that. So if I do set a five, uh, the shell will come back, the tickle shell will come back and say five because that's the value that gets stored in five, okay? So you see B is a variable, three is a literal value. Okay, um, then suppose I want to add A to B. Well, to add A to B, you need to use the expr command, okay? And inside, uh, okay, so here's, let me back up a moment. So here's set again. Set takes is a command that takes two arguments. In this case, it's taking C as a variable. And then it's taking everything here inside the square brackets as a second argument, okay? Square brackets um, are a nested um, execute command. So anything in square brackets is gonna be interpreted as a command again. And so it's gonna take everything in here. It's gonna see the first word that's a command. In this case, it's the expr command, which is a tickle command to do arithmetic evaluations, okay? And then expr takes an argument, uh, which it, then it interprets. In this case, I want to take a and b, and I want to add their values together, okay? The dollar sign means variable substitution. That means take that, take whatever string is after that, in this case, a, and uh, see if it's a variable and evaluate that variable and stick the value in there. So in this case, dollar sign A is going to be five, dollar sign B is going to be three, it adds them together, it gets eight, it sticks eight into C, okay? Um, puts is a command that just writes to the standard output. And here, puts wants a single argument, okay? So you need to give it a single argument, but I want to print out stuff with spaces in it. So you can use double quotes, not single quotes, double quotes, to protect all these spaces so that this all comes in as one, one word, okay? 
And I've got the dollar sign A and the dollar sign B in here and the dollar sign C. So these guys will be uh, substituted. And it comes out, it will print the sum of dollar sign A is five and three is eight, okay? That's one special thing. The quotes, the double quotes will protect the spaces, make it a single word um, for the parser, but we'll do dollar sign evaluation. Another way to protect spaces is with braces, okay? Uh, braces, unlike, okay, the double quotes can't be nested, but braces can be nested, and so they're kind of convenient, but they also disable the variable substitution. So if I put this thing, then I get the sum of dollar sign A and dollar sign B is dollar sign C. I didn't get the substitution here, okay? And that's because these braces disable that, okay? Now we get to the subs command. Uh, braces disable the variable substitution, but if you use subst, substitute, that will then go into this thing and do the variable substitution. It can also do command substitution and other types of substitutions, okay? Read the man page and tickle on subst for full details. But that's why you see subst in the, um, up here. So you see, for example, for fix Zemon, I have curly braces here because I have a bunch of stuff and that has to be a single word. But I also have variables inside here, hx, hy, hz, which are set up here. And I want them evaluated, also mu naught. I want them evaluated inside here. I need to use the subs command with a square bracket around it in order to do the evaluation of the subs command in order to interpolate, in order to do the substitution for those guys. So you'll frequently see that. If you've got, anytime you've got a specified block, if you want to have variables in here which you want to evaluate, you need to wrap it up on a square bracket subs, square bracket at the end. Okay, that's the subs command. There's also an anchor command, it's this increment. If you give it an integer and you say increment, it'll increment it by one. So B was three, becomes four. You can specify an optional uh, argument after it, which is how much to increment by, which can be negative. These all have to be integers, so I can't do this with floating point values. Two more commands that I want to mention, which are useful sometimes in MIF files. Uh, there's a for command, okay? Uh, one of the mistakes a lot of people make with tickle is they try to infer a lot more syntax than actually is there. Four is just a command like everything else in Tickle, okay? It takes a certain number of arguments. It actually wants four arguments. The first argument to four is something which is going to get passed to the command as a command uh, as an initial, for initialization of your for loop. This is a basically a for loop. You can put anything in here that you want as a Tickle command and it will evaluate it as a Tickle command. The second argument to four is the, is, gets plugged into the EXPR command. So this is some arithmetic string that uh, operation that you want performed, it should return uh, true or false. And just like in a for statement, if it's true, you do the loop. If it's false, you break out of the loop. The third argument to for is again, another command argument to tickle. You can put any tickle command in here that you want. In this case, I used inker A, which is why I mentioned it up here. A gets inc incremented, okay, every time you through the loop. And then the last argument is wherever command you want incremented, you want done uh, inside the loop, inside of the loop. And so here, for example, I set A equal to one, I set sum equal to one, and then as long as A is less than five, I do this product, okay? So this is gonna be a factorial. And then the result gets uh, collected into sum, and then if I print that out, you see 120, it's five factorial. There's also an F statement, it works basically the same way. It's got some number of arguments. The first argument is uh, something which gets fed into EXPR. So again, that's some arithmetic operation. And then between, then the next argument is a command that you want run if that statement is true. And you can put an else in here, in which case these are also all arguments, okay? To get out of the tickle shell, you type the word exit, okay? Uh, and just a few other quickies on tickle. There's a list command, which creates a, a collection of objects and you can add to them with like list depends. Sometimes that's needed because some of the, some of the scripts that you use inside MIF commands. They want not a single value return, but a list of values. You typically use lists for that. Um, oh, important thing. In, okay, so here's the proc command. Frequently inside, if you're using any of the script uh, specify objects, uh, they want a proc typically. A proc is, a, is the tickle subroutine, okay? Uh, proc is, like everything else in tickle, it's a command. It takes one, two, three arguments. The first argument, the first argument is the name of the subroutine, the name of the proc, okay? In this case, factorial. The second argument is a list of arguments to that proc, okay? I have just one here because for factorial, I just need to have one argument. And then after that is the body 
of, of, the, of the routine that you want, okay? You notice I put a little pound sign up front here. This is just a comment, okay? Now, main re one of the reasons why I showed this example is this, fact this factorial is going to routine, it uses while instead of for, but it's the same deal. Um, it's going to compute the, the, the factorial, but in addition to returning the factorial, it's going to take that, that answer every time it's called, and it's going, this is a hokey example, but it's going to append it into my list of answers. Okay, so I start out here, I create an empty list called answers, and inside this procedure, I want to append to that uh, global variable. In, this is the key point here. Inside procedures in Tickle, everything, all the variables are local. The parameters that come in, they're copied by value, so they're also local. Okay, so you can change them, it doesn't change anything outside. If you want to affect a variable which is outside the procedure, which you frequently need, want to do sometimes in Tickle, uh, I'm sorry, in MIF, you need to specify it as global. So I say global answers, that makes answers, that pulls this answers from outside, it pulls it inside the routine so that you can modify it there, okay? And you see here I computed factorial seven, factorial three, factorial six. If I print out what currently my list has, it has those three values, one, two, three, as three items in this list. Okay, so for more about Tickle, um, if you go to the tickle-lang.org page, it's got pointers to everything, including this wiki, wiki, uh, this wiki here, which has lists of lots of tutorials on Tickle uh, and TK. So you can scroll through those and look through those, whatever you want, okay, uh, to help you learn more about Tickle as you need it. Uh, there's also, there's a list of 12 rules which pretty much govern everything in Tickle. It's called the Dodecalog, and there's a link there for that if you want to, if you want to get really into the weeds. Okay, um, where are we at? Oof, okay, so let me specify, let me give you the statement for the homework problem right now. Um, this is kind of complicated, it's a little bit challenging. Um, well, um, we can discuss it though in the forum. I can give some hints. I'm going to, I think I'll set up a separate discussion item just for this. And uh, if you want to peek at the answers, you can do that. But here's, here's, the, here's the problem, okay? I want you to set up, wrap a MIF file, and actually, um, after I show you this, if you want to stick around, I'll show you how you can create a MIF file from hand um, live without a net. But um, I want you should, the dimensions of the problem, so you should have an atlas, uh, which has these dimensions in it, right? 500 by 200 by 0.6 nanometers, okay? So it's a thin film. I mentioned here in nanometers, but in the MIF file, they need to be in meters. So it's gonna be E minus nine after each of these, okay? You want the material value to be uh, 1.1 E6 amps per meter. MS gets set inside the driver block, okay? The exchange coupling, uh, this is gonna be uniform exchange, so you can use a uniform exchange uh, module if you want. That's what the exchange value is, okay? There's a uniaxial anisotropy, so you would need to include a specified uniaxial anisotropy block. That value for K along the z-axis. Okay, this problem involves uh, the DMI. So you're going to have to use this extension, um, the DM exchange six neighbor extension. This is created by Rohart and Thiaville um, in RSA, just outside of Paris. Um, and so you can go to the details, some of the details of that extension here, okay? But you want this value for, for the D in that equation. Uh, free boundaries, okay? Uh, so that should be pretty easy to set up. The more, bit, what's a, a little bit tricky is the initial magnetization configuration, okay? So I want an initial configuration, which um, is pointing out of the plane, about the point, if you go from the lower left-hand corner, 50 nanometers to the right and 50 nanometers up, take that point uh, in a circle, which is 16 nanometers in radius, all the magnetization should be pointing in the plus Z direction. Uh, at a radius beyond 23 nanometers, it should be pointing down in the minus Z direction. And in between, you want, the right, you want to set up your script so the magnetization points towards the center point P, okay? Um, and if you want to cheat, uh, the script which does this is uh, in the DMI example. So if you look at the DMI example file, they have a script which does this. Uh, it's not set up to work on these part dimensions. So you're going to have, you can, if you want to, you can take that script and you'll have to tweak it to get it to work properly here. Once you have that initial magnetization set up, use the minimization evolver to minimize it, find an energy minimum, save the equilibrium configuration, and then we will use that, um, 
Yes, here's the rest of it. We run it towards equilibrium, and we will save that final state and use that as an initial configuration for next week's homework in which we'll apply a spin current and we will move the skirmion. Okay. If you start, if you start in this state and you relax, it should relax into a skirmion. Okay. Um, and you can play with it. You can change the cell size, see what effect that has. Um, you will probably find, at least certainly in the smaller cell sizes, that the skirmion won't want to stay in the corner. It's going to try to start drifting up. All right. Um, so practice pinning it. So add, use a more complicated atlas is one way to do it. Um, to create an increased value of K1 locally in a small pinning area in order to pin the skirmion, okay? Um, so that's a little bit harder, um, but we'll discuss that next week also. Okay, the question is, the DMI extension is built into OOMPH2 or do you need to recompile? No, it is built into OOMPH2 and OOMPH1. Um, I believe it's OOMPH1. Uh, if it's not, let me know, but it should, yeah, it, it should be there. So you should not have to do a recompile. You just have to include it in the specified block. Okay, um, all right, so let's see. Uh, do we have any other questions? Um, okay, I can try, oof, um, can I do this or not? I will try to create a MIF file from scratch just to show you how it's done and some little tricks that may be useful to people. Um, let me go ahead and, I'm seeing this now, yep, okay. Get rid of these, okay. All right, so I'm on Windows. Um, one option on Windows is to use Notepad. Let's go down here, okay. So Notepad++, if you're on NanoHub, you can use Genie. You can use Genie actually on any platform if you wanna download and install it. Genie is already installed on NanoHub. Uh, you can use Emacs, you can use whatever you like. You can use just a plain text editor if you want. But it needs to be saved as plain text. So don't do this in Word and save it as a doc because that's not going to work. All right, let me create a new file here. And um, let's see. Um, actually, let's go back to this. Okay, so the very first line of my MIF file has to be pound MIF 2.1. All right, so we'll go ahead and put that in. Pound MIF is actually, you can do 2.1 or 2.2. Okay, and actually I'm going to go under language, T for tickle, tickle, okay. I'm going to mark this, I'm going to, I'm telling Notepad++ that this is a tickle file. That, that gives me some highlighting and some other conveniences. You don't need to do that, it's optional, but it's kind of convenient. And uh, the Genie, which is on NanoHub, I had the system in, set it up so that when you load a .mif file, it automatically goes into that, that form. Um, and there's, okay. I think on Genie, it tells you down here that it's in Tickle, it's using Tickle uh, structure, but whatever. Okay, uh, after that, in my prototypical file here, I have some set commands. Uh, I'm not going to bother with those right now, and I'm not going to set any parameters because it's just gonna be a very simple example. Okay, but the next thing that you need though, is you need to have an atlas. You need to have at least one atlas. So let's create an atlas here using the specify command. Specify. Uh, the name of the atlas and the type of the atlas. So let's make it a multi atlas, just so you can see how that's done. Multi atlas. Uh, it's convenient to give it a name because I'm going to be referring it to it elsewhere, and I don't want to, have to type out multi atlas everywhere. So I'm just going to call it atlas, very original, but okay, that will do that. I don't need to use subs tier because I'm just going to hard code all the values in. So I'm going to put open and close close brace, uh, just to make sure that. Keep my bracing consistent. The multi atlas. Okay, so how do I write a multi atlas? Well, what I typically do, and I recommend that you do, is uh, um, you go to the oomph documentation. Um, okay, well, there are two. There are two pages in the documentation which are useful, in particular. There is one section which talks about the structure of the MIF file. And so you can read all the gory details about how you write a, what's, what's in a MIF file and all the ex different extensions. So there's a specify command, there's uh, destination commands, uh, which are used to have default outputs, uh, the parameter command, all these sorts of things. Okay, you can read files in. All the, all the extensions um, to Tickle are, in, are on that page. There's another page though, which I use frequently myself. And so you'll be using this too, presumably. 
which is the uh, uh, OXS EXT child classes page. Um, if you go up to the front page, whoops, I went, to the, I went too far. You go to the documentation. You go to the OOMF user's guide in the front there, there is OOMF extensible solver, OXS, and underneath there is the standard OXS EXT child classes. You're going to be referring to this, to this a lot. Bring up this page. Okay, I want to create an atlas. So here at the top here, there's links on the HTML version to all the different objects. And I want to do a multi atlas. So I'm going to go down here and I get a little uh, explanation on what the parameters are to that, okay? So I go to my notepad and I say, okay, uh, here I have OXS Multi Atlas, the name, and then the first thing is, then I start, use the keyword Atlas, which is a child, uh, an atlas inside, and then I put in whatever that's going to be. So I'm going to use uh, OXS Box Atlas because it's the easiest, but you can put in any atlas in here that you want. And I'm going to give it a name because this is going to be the region name. And I'm going to call it left. Okay. And I need two curly braces to close that because I've got one there and one there. And now I put in whatever I normally put into a box atlas, which in case you don't remember, um, I'm losing some of my controls due to zoom here, but there's a box atlas. There's a box atlas. It takes X range, Y range, Z range, and then an optional name. Um, if you don't put a name here, it takes whatever the atlas name is as the region name. So I already called it left. So I just need to put in a value for X range. And I'm going to make this one go from say zero to 100 nanometers. That's going to be my X range. And then Y range, I'll have that also go from say zero to 100 nanometers and Z range. Let's make that one a little bit shorter. Uh, let's say it's 25. Okay, and that's one atlas. Okay, and I'm going to do another atlas. I'll make this also be a box atlas. Um, commonly, these guys you make them disjoint, but they don't have to be disjoint. If they're not disjoint, what happens is when you feed a point into multi atlas, you say what region is it in. It goes through these atlases in the order that are specified, and the first one that the point is inside. It returns a region from that atlas. So actually, I can make this one here, I can make it the full volume. And in effect, it'd be the same as uh, if I just made it the right hand half, which is what I'm going to do here. So X range, let's make this one go from 100 E minus 9 to 200 E minus 9. So 100 to 200 nanometers. And then I'll keep Y range and Z range the same. Let's see if I can copy and paste here. Okay, and uh, that's my atlas. Okay, so now I have an atlas. Next thing you need is a mesh, All right? So uh, specify, access, we we'll use a rectangular mesh. Again, I'm gonna give this a name because I need to refer to it in some other places probably. And um, so, um, oh, also, I'm going to make a little mistake here so you can see what happens. So suppose I write, I'm going to have one dimension for the um, uh, XY cells. So I'm going to say XY cell, let's make those five nanometers. And I'm going to have a Z cell be, um, let's make those 10 nanometers just to see what happens. And then inside here, I'm going to put uh, the cell size. If you pull up, if you go over to the, um, the web page, you'll see that uh, rectangular mesh has an argument called cell size, which takes three values, which are the X discretization, um, the Y discretization, which in this case is the same, and the Z discretization, okay? Uh, oh, and you need to specify also the atlas that you're discretizing. So in this case, it's just atlas if I can spell. Okay, uh, boom. so what's next? Um, okay, I'm gonna have some energy terms, right? So specify, uh, I need to have exchange. So I'm just gonna do uniform exchange. And um, that takes a parameter A. Again, if you go over here and you look up the uniform exchange, it tells you that you just need uh, one, param one value in here, it's A. And I'm going to give the value, say, 12e minus 12. Okay, and that's all that you need 
inside the uniform exchange. And I like to do micromagnetics, so I like to include a DMAG. And uh, again, I don't need to specify on that. Let's go ahead and include um, uh, anisotropy. So this is going to be uniaxial anisotropy. And um, OK, K1. OK, so uniaxial anisotropy takes two values, K1. And um, let's see if I can maybe pull that up here. I have to make this smaller so I can actually get to it. OK, um, doo -doo -doo. so you go down here, you say energy terms. There's a bunch of energy terms. Uniaxial anisotropy is there. I click on that. It takes a K1 or an H value. If you specify, if rather specify your anisotropy in terms of field instead of K, that's not choice. It's either or. It talks about that here. And then an axis. OK, so K1. Um, OK, I'm going to. Uh, vary, I'm going to have a spatially varying K1. So inside here, I'm going to specify an atlas scalar field. I'm going to use the atlas, named atlas. And uh, it takes values, whoops. Um, Okay, so in the left region, which was specified in the atlas above, I'm going to give it the value 5e4 for k1. Okay, so that's the value for k1, joules per meter cube. And in the right hat region of the atlas, I'm going to make that minus 5e4. Okay, so this one's going to be easy axis, is going to be easy plane. Okay, and then I need to close that, I need to close that, I need to close that. I'm going to go ahead and so that's K1. Then I also need an axis. Um, so let's just um, make this uh, uniform in space. So I'll say it's along the y axis is, is the axis for, the, for that. Um, now I did this, I defined this scalar field. I did it in line. I just put it here. If you want to, and if it's more convenient, you can actually put that in a separate specify block with a name. And then in here, instead of writing this out, you just put that name in, okay? I did that, for example, in the, um, uh, previously for the initialization of the magnetization. Okay, and then I need to close off that specify block, okay? And then, let's see here. Uh, Tickle does not care about indenting, okay? It's not Python. Okay, I need to have an evolver. So if I, okay, I'm going to use conjugate gradient evolver. And I'm going to call it evolve. And I'm not going, I'm just going to use the defaults. And then I need also a, almost done here, uh, min driver to go with the evolver. Uh, I'm not referring to it anyway, so I don't, any place I don't need to give it a name. Again, if you pull up the man page for that, you'll see that you're required to specify the evolver, which in this case is called uh, evolve. You also need to specify the mesh, which in this case I named the mesh. Uh, you need to specify um, a value for the saturation magnetization. Okay, again, I could do this, uh, I could have it vary spatially if I wanted to, but I'm just going to use uh, uh, my favorite value for uh, permaloid. And then uh, for initial magnetization, um, I'm going to use a random vector field for the uh, initial configuration. Yeah, if you look that up in the main page, you'll see that it requires two values, a minimum norm and a maximum norm. And this is M naught, this is a normalized magnetization, so it should be one. And so I can just specify um, one for both the min and the max there. And oh, I need a stopping condition. condition. Uh, so I know, so the simulation knows when to stop. And for the min driver, that's M cross H cross M. And I'm going to give that the value of 1e minus 3, say. And that's it. OK. So let's see what we can do here. OK. Um, so now there are some errors in that file. OK. And they will, I will find those out when I go to try to load it, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing this exercise. So you can see what happens when you make mistakes and how you fix them. Right. So I'm bringing up MM Launch now. I'm bringing up Oxy. 
Okay. I need to save this file. So let's save it. Um, where's it going to go here? It's going on my desktop. Let's just call it silly.nif. Okay. You need to add extensions on yourself. And um, let's save that. And uh, let's see. Okay, so here's Oxy. Bring it up. I'll load. And let's go up to the desktop. There's my thing. I might click browse because well, there's going to be some errors and I don't want to have to keep bringing this up. And I will apply. And oh, I get an error message. Invalid command, X, Y, cell. Hmm, okay. You look farther down, it tells you that, oh, line 15. It doesn't know what that is. So we go up here to line 15. Oh, Excel. Okay, Excel is not a tickle command. Set is a tickle command. So I need to put set here. And that one's going to give me the same problem. Okay, so I do that and I save. Okay, now I go back here. I say okay. And Oxy's still running. It doesn't crash. Um, I've tried to make it fairly robust to errors in the MIF file. If you have a MIF file which causes Oxy to go down, send the example to me and I'll try to fix it. But otherwise, you can just go in and you just keep hitting apply. Oh, extra characters after closed brace. Oh, I don't know what this one is. Uh, oh, I got too many braces here in my rectangular mesh. I didn't do that on purpose. I got too many braces. So let's get rid of one of them. Okay, save it. Try it again. And you just keep doing this until all the errors go away. All right, okay. Cell size is not a list of three real numbers. I did this one because this one's a little bit harder to figure out sometimes. You know that it involves uh, the rectangular mesh uh, specified block. So we go to the rectangular mesh and we look at it and we say, oh, these aren't three numbers. What do you mean they're not three numbers? I set them to be five and 10 nanometers. Oh, it's inside curly braces. The dollar sign is not expanded. This is why you need to use subst. If you don't use subst, you're going to get some error message like that that you can't quite understand. Okay, so let's go back again. Apply. Okay, rectangular mesh range is not an integral multiple of cell size. So again, I'm stuck on the mesh. You go back to the mesh. Range is not an integral multiple of cell size. Well, my Z range is 25 nanometers, but I specified a cell size of 10. 10 doesn't divide into 25, so that's going to give me an error. So let's make a 12.5. Save that. Okay, okay on the error message and apply. Um, Enable to create inline object with args max, min norm and max norm. Let's see what I do wrong there. I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Random vector field. Um, I don't, oh, I misspelled. <laughs> Not a real object. Okay, so this should be, Random vector field. Okay. Okay, let's try this again. Hopefully it works now. Yay, it worked. No more error messages. So if I go back to here, go back to Oxy now, it's loaded. If I open up uh, MMDisp, almost done here, racing to the end, and I send the magnetization, the initial magnetization is like that. And if I run it, and it'll go and it finishes and now it's relaxed. Voila, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, is there, a, okay, so some of the questions while well, we have time for, is there a simpler way to create multi-layers with more than 20 repetitions? Yes, you use your power of tickle script, right? So you write, write a, a while loop or a for loop in tickle script to initialize everything, okay? Um, can you define multiple uniaxial anisotropies? Yes, you can. You just include multiple specified blocks with uniaxial anisotropies. As I noted, the one, uh, cap, one key point is you have to give each of them a different instance name, or you'll get an error message about that name already being used. Uh, how to set different vamping constants and different atlases? Um, you want to have one atlas which, um, uh, cover, which describes all the regions, the definitions of the regions where you want the damping constant to change. But you can have as many atlases as you want. So um, just create an atlas specifically for the damping, if that's what you need to do. And then uh, use a atlas scalar field to specify uh, the damping at each point. If you prefer, you can use any of the scalar field objects to set a scalar field. 
So if it's more convenient to use a script to specify the damping on a point by point basis, you can do that as well. It doesn't matter. Uh, what does the stopping value in the min driver and the time driver mean? Um, so when you get to the end of a stage, what's the end of a stage? Well, it depends upon what the stopping criteria is. So in the min driver is typically it's a, uh, a value of the torque, m cross, m cross h cross m. If it gets below that particular value, um, then it will say, oh, I'm at the end of the stage, I should stop, okay? In the time driver, there are several things. You can use stopping VMDT, which will stop if the uh, DMDT, the change in magnetization, is below a certain threshold. I think that's in degrees per nanosecond, it says in the documentation. Or you could use a stopping condition, which is simulation time. So you could say, oh, I want to stop after one nanosecond and then two nanoseconds and so on. Okay, there's different things. You can use them, mix them and match them, me, mix them and match them as you like. Can we give current in plane parameter um, blah, 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 under therm spin transfer evolve or therm hewn evolve while designing file for thermal fluctuations? Um, this gets complicated. I'm not that familiar with those. Um, uh, extensions. I will take a look at them and I will try to answer that offline. Is it possible to save the magnetization or energy terms of each atlas separately? Yes, you can save regions. You can save, yeah, you can, yeah, you can do, the default outputs are over the entire volume, okay? Um, scalar outputs, there, there are some fancy ways to do the, to print out, say, the average magnetization in some particular region. Okay, you can do this. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. I'll do that uh, next time. Uh, in terms of the output of the vector fields or the scalar fields, those are all or nothing. You write out the whole thing. But once you save it out, there are some tools which will allow you to go in and clip out blocks of it if you want. Okay, and I think maybe that's enough. Um, are we good? I need a moderator here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we answered a lot of questions. It's already two hours of lecture. Many people are probably already quite tired as well. Um, so for the, I guess for the rest of the question, we received more, many more questions than what we can answer here. So the rest of the questions, we'll be answering them in NanoHub uh, forum, okay? And uh, actually, uh, thank you very much, Mike, for this uh, great talk. We have uh, two more sessions to go. And before um, we let everybody go, we're going to run a quick poll, actually. Yeah, and also, don't forget to do the homework, OK? Oh, yes. It will be graded. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll post some information about that. Uh, this, this is in the, the slides, which are already posted on the homepage. I'll put them also on the NanoHub, and uh, I'll set up a discussion for them on the NanoHub.